Thank you. Thank you. And I said I wasn't going to do it, but you never get a <laughs> How many times do you get an opportunity to do a selfie with your hero? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. First of all, I want to let me thank your co health commissioner for inviting me and thank this, your committee for inviting me to, to be a part of this wonderful conference. If you don't know, you've heard some of the best speakers I've heard on infant mortality. Just let me tell you, you did. You know, I, and I've heard lots of speakers speak on uh, infant mortality. And if you heard nothing else, You've had a good day. I think that when you, we heard about what, the things that they're doing in, uh, at the Cincinnati Cradle of Care, we were all impressed and felt that they were really doing some good things to make a difference. And, you know, I'm going to go home and tell my husband that I'm going to have to do better. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I, I thought, oh, you can't change the baby's diaper. You know, and so, I, but our two sons, you know, when it's important, even now they'll come and we'll be chatting about everything and they'll say, Ma, I need to talk to Daddy. So, uh, so I do, I, I, was very, I was very impressed and thought we had a wonderful talk. Well, I'm very pleased to be here and to be p a part of your Labor of Love Summit and on what you're doing to help re reduce infant mortality. So. We all know that we have too many babies die each year in our, in our country. We have more than 4 million babies born in the United States each year, but 23,000 die, or died in 2014. And I want you to know that I was just asked, what was the number when I was Surgeon General? It was more than 40,000. And we used to talk about the infant mortality being 40,000, but we, we've done a good job, but it's not good enough. We're still far behind what many countries do. I have some things on my slide that I'm gonna skip up rather rapidly, mostly because you've heard it already. And I, so I won't, don't, won't need to talk about, uh, we all know that if you lose a baby, that that's serious business. We all know that low birth weight is the leading cause of infant mortality in the world. We know that nothing is better. I always say the uterus is the best place in the world for a baby until they get up to about 3,000 grams. And the infant mortality is the lowest in normal weight infants from 3,000 to 3,500 grams. We know that any time they are less than 2,500, we call them low birth weight, and the infant mortality increases very rapidly as the weight go down. And our neonatologists are excellent, and they've made a great big difference with all of their knowledge and technology and what they do in those level three high, high level nurseries. But when they get down below, a thousand grams, the infant mortality rapidly increases. We know that low birth weight infants are 40 times more likely to die in the neonatal period. Very, this is less than 1,500 gram babies are 200 times more likely to die in the neonatal period. And we've already mentioned the low birth weight markedly decreased in the past decade. And we don't know why. I think it's because of the many things many of you are doing in your communities, and you've heard about many of those already. And you've also heard about that our neonatologists just are so much better off, but we've still, sadly, ranked behind 27 other industrialized nations. And that's not good. You all, you've already learned that Infant mortality is the death of a baby before they get to their first birthday. And the infant mortality rate is a number of infants who die 
per number of live births. And I know you've heard, and I don't, and I'm, I can't explain it, and I don't know that science has explained it yet, but we know a lot of things, that African-American mothers are 2.4 times more likely to have a low birth weight baby. Very often, they began prenatal, prenatal care late. American Indians and Alaska Natives are 1.6 times the infant mortality rate as white women. Puerto Rican infants are two times as likely to die from causes related to low birth weight. And the infant mortality rate is 1.7 times greater for even native Hawaiians than for non-Hispanic whites. We t already talked about what infant mortality is. If they die very early from fetal death, that's from 22 weeks, you know, that's, we often call that, but 20 weeks, that's, we say that's pre-viable. But at 22 weeks to birth, if they die from 22 weeks to birth, that's up to, a one, up to one week. We call that perinatal mortality. Neonatal mortality is a, if they die from birth to 28 days, and if we call it post-neonatal death, it's from 29 days up to one year. So this is, that's just how the definitions are. Some countries, sometimes there's some question, uh, the reason why our infant mortality may look as bad as it does sometimes is that some cu countries don't, you know, those 22-weekers, they, 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 they count them as stillbirths. They don't, they don't count them. So, but but we, we count if they're born. And so, so that's, that's how we, that's just, those are just definitions. Infant mortality, we just mentioned, varies very greatly by race. 2.4 times higher for black women. It's much higher uh, from, for Puerto, black and Hispanic and Puerto Rican women as compared to whites, primarily due to preterm births. You know, we, they're just born too soon. We know how to take care very well. As I said, we do a good job in the nursery, but if they get too small, you know, even our, nurse, our level three nurseries can't take care of it. Whereas the high infant mortality for Alaska Natives and uh, American Indian women is primarily due to high, uh, they have, they have few, don't have as many new premature babies, but uh, and not, that's not necessary. They have probably more deaths in, in bigger babies in and around, you know, after the babies are born. And the higher infant mortality rate from SIDS contributes the most to the high infant mortality rate gap between the American Indian and the um, uh, native and, and the white population. So you have to look, black women and Puerto Rican women is high prematurity. And for the uh, Alaskan and uh, uh, American, it's more things that probably related to environment and things that, and infection and thing and, and less a port, the in care is not as well. And then of course, we can certainly feel that maybe they're in, 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 in Alaska, they may be bundling them up. And I think you have a wonderful program here in uh, your ABC program that you're partnering with. If we look at the world infant mortality rate, that the part, we know the dark, dark green, those are the best. Finland, Australia, Canada, they're the best. They, the, those are infant mortality rates are usually, uh, you know, less than four or five. The, the real dark, the darkest uh, part in red and darker red is more the, uh, the African countries. And so the United States and, and uh, Russia uh, and, uh, and China are not too different. This is the United States. Sadly, Arkansas, we are down in the 8 to 11 
I, I thought we did better. When we look at our white, just white infant mortality rates, we seem to do, we are in, every, in every state, everywhere, we do a lot better. Uh, the richer states, and of course, you, you almost made it, Indiana. You, you, your, your infant mortality rate is 7.1, so you got kicked. You, we we're still down at, in the 7.2, but you, you went from 7.2 to 7.1, but this is the light, blo light blue or states with infant mortality rates less than four. Uh, before or less, and of course, when the six is the lighter blue, and of course, uh, the more red you have, the worse you are. There, there you are, Indiana, with your infant mortality rate. But what I put this slide up to show your state, and as you can know, what you have, this is not infant mortality rate, but this correlates very well with the, the overall death rate and how well people do. The poor, your larger cities, your poorer cities, your higher, inf your higher African American uh, parts of your state are where you have the highest infant mortality rates and the greatest number of problems. This is looking at the United States compared with all, I realize you can't read those numbers and I, I apologize for that, but the United States is behind 28 other industrialized countries. We're at the bottom. That green, that light is the United States. And those up above us in blue is the rest of the world. So we rank number 26 behind uh, Slovakia. So we're behind many other developed countries. And that's just saying that we rank behind 20 other industri industrialized countries. The infant mortality rate for 2013 for Indiana was 7.22 per thousand. I understand for 2014, you were at 7.1. And we're, we're, we're all proud about that. And for the United States, we're, we're getting there, but we're at 5.96 per thousand. We're, we're, we're making progress. What are the top causes of infant mortality? The five top causes is birth defects, preterm delivery, or low birth weight, very low birth weight, maternal complications of pregnancy, SIDS, and injuries such as suffocation. And again, I think the, your ABC program and the fact that you're partnering with other people, other institutions, including athletes, the Colts, to provide blankets, uh, sacks for babies to sleep in. You know, as I said, I remember when I was at home, we, we wanted to put babies on their stomachs to sleep so they wouldn't aspirate, you know, uh, when, if they vomit. Well, of course, now we all know about your wonderful back to sleep program. Your know, parents felt, well, they need to sleep with them. A baby had to keep their babies to sleep with them. You know, I've, I've gotten where people come to my house with a baby. I take out the drawer or whatever. I said, I'm sorry, your baby can't sleep in the bed with you. I said, what if something happened to it in my house? Yeah, what, what I'm saying is we have to make sure, and, but, uh, but you're, you, you know, make sure they're alone, you know, Often, as I said, parents will put the babies on their stomach and go to sleep and, and turn over and sleep on them. And they don't, you know, they, they, they're meaning well. So these are things that, that we have to do and really try and want to really make a real difference. And I'm, we're proud of, proud of what you're, you're doing. What are some of the factors contributing to infant mortality? Well, you, we, 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 preterm birth for the whole world is the most important contributing factor. Poverty, lower education. You know, we have to get the schools involved. We've got to educate parents, educate children, educate the community, educate the church, educate the pastors, every, everybody. 
has got to be involved in making a difference. We know that people that you heard, you heard why people that are unmarried may like more likely have a higher infant mortality rate. You know, we, you know, they didn't have that wonderful contribution and support of fathers and the stress that's associated with not having a father. I don't know what I would have done without my husband. I guess I would have, I don't know, I, I probably, we don't, we don't like to think about that. Uh, being African-American. Oh, we know that African-American women, for whatever reason, but you know, when they looked at African, and they found that this was true, you know, the Army did a very large study where they knew all of the women got the same prenatal care, you know, had the same good doctor, same support system, and they still had low birth weight babies, uh, more likely to have a low birth weight baby. And then when they compared college-educated black women with high school white women, they found that the college-educated black women had more likely to have a low birth weight baby than the high school white women. So what, we don't know all of the factors, but we know that stress is a very important and real factor. And, and I think probably contributes, you know, the uh, diversity that we have in our, in our system. We're the most diverse country in the world. We have more, we speak more than 28 different languages in our country. So other countries are far more homogeneous. We know that makes a real difference. Well, you know if you're poor, you're living in a poor environmental conditions. And of course, we've got to educate our politicians. They've got to understand the importance of addressing the factors that we need to address. I think when we were talking about fathers, you know, we said, well, why haven't we done something about that? Well, you know, we haven't educated our politicians of the importance of having rules, regulations, governing that we need to address this. And somebody was mentioning that you know, if the father, if there were the father's shoes in the house, well, then they had to, that said that a father was in the home and they cut off the welfare. So I'm saying, we're learning. We didn't mind, we don't mind being the world's fattest jailer. Have the high, we have the highest number of people in prison than Russia or any other country. And we pay, and it costs more to keep a young person in jail than it costs to send them to Harvard or the University of Indiana. So I'm saying that, you know, I think that we've got to start listening to some of the facts that we've known for years and done nothing with them. And we've got to educate our politicians. Well, we, I think probably our health departments have made sure we have clean drinking water. But in some of the developed countries, that's not true. We know that immunizations, you know, that mothers have appropriate immunizations, uh, you know, and, and get in that these are up to date. And of course, our public health infrastructure very much influence the health of the, of the baby and what's going to go on. So I think that that's, a, what are some of the things we know? We know our population is changing. We're getting older. We're getting more diverse. And by 2045, it used to be 2050, the minority population will make up, will make up of 50% of our population. So we, these are things we've got to address. The nature of disease is changing. Disparities are persistent. We've been saying we were working, we've been working on them for 100 years. We're still working on it. But we've got to do something about it if we're going to make a difference. And I mentioned that we've got, we've got the most expensive sick care system in the world. And if you get sick, we know how to take care of you. But we haven't learned how to keep you well. And that goes for all of our society as well as for our babies. And I think that we've got to do more, do a better job with that. And, and we've got to focus on preventing problems, not focus on how well we can, we can take care of them after they happen. So the best way to reduce infant mortality, absolutely the best way, is to make sure we have a full term or as close to term baby and we've got to prevent premature births as much as we can. And there's, there are some things that we can do.
our population data, we know the world population is presently over 7 billion. The U.S. population, we make about 5% of the U.S. of the world population. 74 million children, and we seniors are coming along. We're, push, we're pushing you. And I'm, I'm proud about that. That just means we're living longer. But uh, you have to take care of us now. And I'll tell you how many prisoners we've got. But we've got to keep these babies coming along so they can take good care of us. We have our ethnic diversity at the present time, we're about 63% European-American, 13% uh, African-American, 15% uh, Hispanic. So uh, we're very diverse. Now, medical system is best suited to know how to take care of diseases of the past. We know how to take care of acute infections. And we've got to learn how to take care of chronic disease because 75% of our new diseases are our diseases that we've gotten that are chronic diseases, and we're doing better with that. And we don't take good care of our premature babies. Many of them can end up, you know, we may save their life, but they may have chronic problems forever. And I put this slide in as an old ancient uh, uh, Chinese proverb. And it says, if we don't change our direction, we're likely to end up where we're headed. And I think that that's true. We've got to change how we're thinking about things and change what we're doing and how we're doing it. We know we've got disparities in health care and the quality of health care. We've got problems related to the system, related to the provider, as well as our patients. We, you know, some, you know, we often talk about how, well, we give all of our patients the same. Well, Though most of you in this room know that sameness is not good enough. That won't get the job done. You know, I, I remember my obstetrician was saying, he, we, we're talking about an eighth grade, someone with a sixth or eighth grade education who, uh, who, who was unmarried, uh, uh, very poor, and my obstetrician was saying, well, you know, he gave her the, the same information that he gave me. Well, that just won't hack it. And so we have to know that because many of them can't even read. You know, most of our pop, most of our education was written for at least eighth grade education, and many of some of our people are sixth graders. So, reading level. We know that healthcare disparities is a difference in, in care of experience of one population compared to another, and we, I, you've heard this several times: the difference between healthcare disparities and health and health care disparities. Well, let's talk about health equity for just a minute. Healthy People 2020 defines health equity as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. And achieving health equity, we got to va value everyone's health. And I thought this was just a wonderful slide, and I'm sorry the very top of it is cut, cut off, but it looks at the difference between equality if, you, if they're looking at a baseball game or a football game or whatever, and they're looking over a fence, if you provide the tallest kid, the medium-sized kid, and the shortest, well, then that, that you may provide them the same, equally the same everything, but you won't help the one that's the shortest. Whereas a very short kid there, uh, you can give him two levels, and finally he can be able to see over the fence. But if you remove all the barriers, they all can see with, without the support. Some of the solutions to health care inequity is we, we, they get diagnosed early. Our affordable care help is helping a lot, but we, we know that it needs fixing. We've got to have, we've got to have better patient education. We've got to have more preventive health care. Fewer penalties for our safety net hospitals. We've got wider access because they have wider access to high technology. We've got a better primary care. We've got to have a social system that supports health care and our social determinants. We already know all the different groups that's affected. That's all the different groups. You know, if you get old, if you have gender, social, poor, uneducated, they're all, we're all affected. If we look at the social determinants of health, you know, we can have the best doctors in the world. 
but if we don't have, we, if they don't get health care, if they lack education, if they have poor housing, poor physical environment, all of these things, income, race relations, our justice system, we've mentioned that maybe the stress is a thing that affects many of our minority women, all affect the health outcomes. Our health goals of 2020, we aren't going to get there. We want a society in which all people live long, healthy lives. What can we do? Pregnancy outcomes are influenced by a woman's health and differ by factors such as race, ethnicity, age, location, and all those other good things. So some of the things we can do to help have healthier babies is have women focus on being healthy before they get pregnant. Have a planned, wanted pregnancy. And not, as I said, not having children when they don't, don't want to have children. Prevent unplanned pregnancies. We've got to address health issues with their health care provider before they start adopting. And we've got to adopt healthy lifestyles. Now, you heard about not smoking. We all know that smoking causes a baby to have a lower weight, lower birth weight. Not drinking. You know, we've, we've had, uh, uh, you know, alcohol of baby, uh, reduced babies. Remember we, when we used to have all, all the neurological defects, birth, we, so they added folic acid and make sure the women are taking adequate amounts of folic acid. So we've, you know, fortified everything. So now it's kind of hard not to get enough. We maintaining an ideal body weight, being physically active. Well, you, you, we all aren't physically active. If you smoke, quit. You know, we get, we need to tell women, just ask them about smoking, and tell them to quit if they do. And don't drink excessively, and don't use street drugs. And make sure they get all the screening management for everything they do. And you know, we all go out and take any kind of medication. And so taking the, don't take any medication your doctor didn't provide. And have visiting health care or providers as recommended. Get all your necessary screenings. Reduce intimate partner violence. We know that that's a real problem. We talk about fathers, but sometimes the fathers and the intimate partners may not necessarily be the same, but we've talked about whoever is a significant other in the home. And and learning as much as we can about the family history. So in order to achieve these goals that we set out, we've got to have, we've got to have educational goals, we've got to early childhood education, comprehensive health education, parent education. We've got to educate the whole community if we're going to make a real difference in infant mortality. We've got to have prevention strategies. I think we've, you've already, you know, we've heard about your ABC programs. You've heard about some of the other programs that are going on to prevent problems, prevent teenage pregnancies, because they, we know they're more likely to. Have. We've got to have proper intervention strategies. We've got to have strategies of compassion. The reason why, as I said, many times they stop supporting the mother when the father is in the home. That's the lack of compassion for what's going on. We've got to continue to do high quality research that's been done, been done in many of our nurseries. We've got to educate, educate, educate our politicians. And we've got to have some leadership strategies as occur in this room. The five C's of good leadership. And all of you <coughs> will be going back to your communities and will be the leaders in trying to prevent infant mortality. We've got to have clarity of vision. We've got to have consistency. We've got to be competent to do the job. We've got to have commitment. In order to have commitment, you have to be committed to make it to happen. And of course, somebody has to be in control. And of course, your health commissioner feels that he better be in control if, he's, if he wants to do infant mortality. So our vision for the 21st century is we're going to have healthy people in healthy communities. We're going to design and develop leadership or develop consumer responsive healthcare systems for all ages. Healthcare system that's available, 
affordable, and accessible. It's patient-centered, prevention-focused, purpose-driven, and solution-oriented. You know, all of our health care is not like that. It needs to foster individual responsibility, human dignity, improve health status, and enhance quality of life. So our roles and responsibilities as partners, a whole community has to be involved. We've got to be aware of the problem, advocates of the problem, and develop an action plan to make it happen. We've got to reach out and be responsible. The tools of commitment are time, talent, treasures. For the end and partners, we've got to nurture and determine what the needs of our community are, are and we've got to do it now. We've got to educate and empower everybody that's involved. We've got to have research, rules, reg and regulations, and we've got to be successful. We can't afford to fail. The most important thing we've got to do is educate our community. The only, Benjamin Franklin said many years ago, so the only thing more expensive than education is ignorance. And of course, we are all aware of how that happens. There's an old Igbo saying, it says, not to know is bad. Not to want to know is worse. Not to hope is unthinkable. But not to care is absolutely unforgivable. And so we as a society, we have to know that a society grows great when old men and old women plant shoot trees under whose shade they know they'll never sit. And you're planting trees for the bright young people of the future to sit under. Thank you very much.